Thank you, John. Uh, we have had uh, troikas um, uh, all day today with uh, fond memories of the Brezhnev era. Um, <laughs> I thought that uh, in light of the um, somewhat more Thomist tone that the uh, proceedings have taken this afternoon, that we would go with trinities uh, hereafter. <laughs> Um, which also allude a little bit to the Roman law aspect and therefore church law aspect of the Star Chamber. My uh, first trinity is Chris Green, Mitch Berman, and Tom Colby. Chris. Uh, what has afflicted me? I asked you that yesterday and you said you didn't know, but uh, uh, it seems like a really important, it seems like a zippy verb uh, that might have some mens rea uh, uh, embedded in it. Uh, I'm just generally curious about which of the constitutional verbs are uh, disparate impacty and which of them are uh, 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 Washington v. Davis. Uh, yeah. uh, like, uh, I mean, so, yeah. well, and then, and then just oh, a, a second thought. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very curious for uh, 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 for Don's kind of concluding thought about the U.S. Attorney's Office. To what extent do these principles? Uh, only by judges, or do they actually apply to executive? Because especially you look at, I mean, the, the English practice, the really, we didn't, you didn't have executive judicial separation of powers. Jeffries was sort of an executive official. Uh, uh, if, if, uh, if there's nothing really in the text that suggests judges are particularly uh, 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 at issue, is this a good route to uh, Bill Stunts's uh, uh, sorts of proposals limiting uh, uh, Prosecutorial discretion. Mitch. I've got a lot of thoughts, but they're all mostly, mostly they're very trivial. Uh, I'd be interested to hear more about how a purposive or intentionality reading fits with other clauses, uh, sort of along Chris's lines. Also, putting, moving a little bit from the historical perspective, to contemporary doctrinal jurisprudential perspective, interested in hearing a little bit more about how Thomas's and Scalia's preference for an intent-based or actor-based standard here fits with their resistance uh, or possibly embrace of such standard in other constitutional contexts. And I'll just say that I don't think it's a culpable, culpable mental state might not be what you most want. Maybe it's really a, a, a more Aretea concept, I think, than a moral one. So it's really a viciousness and not a culpability or blameworthiness for wrongdoing standard. Uh, that's just a, a tiny, friendly little suggestion. I've got my other friendly little thoughts I'll just raise with you offline, as it were. Tom? Uh, so I guess this is more of an observation than a question, but I'd be curious to hear whether you agree with it or not. And it, it's an observation that Don made, I, I think, also in his remarks. It seems to me that at the end of the day, on your reading, unusual does all the work in this clause. Your point is to reject what you think is a false understanding of the original meaning of cruel, pursuant to which that term did a lot of work in defining the scope of the clause. But once we reject that meaning, what we end up with is that the measure of the constitutionality of a punishment under the Eighth Amendment is determined by whether that sentence is unusual in relation to longstanding tradition. We don't care how cruel it is in the absolute. We don't even care how cruel it is in proportion to the offense in the abstract. We care only about how cruel it is in proportion or in comparison to what has come before, which means that at the end of the day, if you're right, we really only care about unusual. Is that right? That's the first really trinity. Cool. All right, the first, the first trinity. I'm very intimidated by the trinity. Um, I feel like Kevin should still be coming from the sky. Um, so what is inflicted? I, as I just said, this is my entire career, right? Let's not preempt it by asking me these questions early. Um, you, you, know, you told me last night that you were going to ask me this. So I, 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 I did a quick look at the Johnson and Webster dictionaries, right? And so the Latin root of inflicted is something like to flog or to beat. Um, and sort of the, the, the usage that Johnson and Webster both give it is, uh, is essentially to lay on as in a punishment, right? So it implies that the standard mode of punishment is corporal in nature, which actually was sort of historically true at the time uh, it was inflicted. I'm not sure that it has any um, moral connotation associated with it, but obviously that would take a, a lot of, of work. As I, as I said at the beginning, dictionaries are, are very imperfect guides. So 
Um, it's a juicy word in some ways, but I don't know that it has a moral valence or not. Um, do these principles bind the executive? And so, yeah, I mean, in fact, actually what's new about the American system is that it binds the legislature, not that it binds the executive, right? The, the, in England, um, uh, it was judges who could be bound by a prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment, but, but not parliament, because certainly by the, the latter part of the 18th century, parliamentary supremacy had taken hold. So the notion that a judge could strike down a law duly enacted by parliament was no longer part of the English system, whereas that idea was the very basis for the American Revolution. Um, uh, the, um, so, uh, Mitch, you asked, uh, does, does the purpose of reading of cruel, and by, by purpose of, I, I take you to mean the intent-based reading of cruel, how does that fit with their treatment of other clauses? You know, I don't know for, I mean, obviously, the, the, one, the one that jumps to mind is the Fourth Amendment, where they, they, they sort of, when, when talking about what's reasonable, they go out of their way to avoid looking into the minds of government officials and sort of try to create an objective standard. Um, I don't know whether there's any um, whether there's any consistent course of practice, right? I can think of instrumental reasons why they might want an objective approach to the Fourth Amendment and a subjective approach to the Eighth Amendment. And if we posit that they're acting in bad faith as originalists and they're actually uh, using that as a cover for instrumental rationales, that might be one explanation for a difference. Um, or it may be that they think the original meaning is actually different in the two contexts, but I'm, I'm not sure. It's a very interesting question, though, and uh, worth pursuing. Um, the um, the uh, contemporary perspective, um, how does the intent standard fit within that? And could you specify that a little bit more for me? I was just struck by the suggestion that courts are better at investigating whether someone is acting from what you call a culpable mental state, but I would describe somewhat differently, yeah. given the standard, but I think mistaken, but right. still standard rhetoric that, boy, courts can't figure out purposes or intentions. Instead, we've got to look to some sort of objective facts in the world. Right, so. right. Well, I think that it's because um, it has to do with burden of proof, right? So, so, so the notion is... Um, if the burden is on the person challenging the punishment to show the existence of this intent, then it's going to be relatively hard for them to meet that burden. So again, if we're looking at it from a purely instrumental point of view, if my goal is to limit judicial discretion by limiting the scope of cases that judges will even consider, if I put an intent requirement on top of any harshness requirement, I can weed out a lot of cases without having to worry about unjust harshness. And so I think that's what, whereas in the Fourth Amendment circumstance, if my goal is to give rules that the police can follow, right, if that's what I'm trying to do, then um, of course I, I, I'm going to exclude intent and I'm just going to tell them here are the objective things that you need to do because the, the, the way these cases come to the court is very, very different. Um, and again, but I'm not saying that that's what motivated these justices because I don't, I, I don't know that at all. But I would say that, that the, the intent requirement has a very different instrumental valence in the two different circumstances. Um, and thanks for the, the, the note on culpability versus Jaratea. This is actually, I, I, in the new version that I asked Mike to send out, I tried to reduce the use of culpable mental state as much as I could and, and change that to cruel intent versus cruel effects. But, but, um, but again, that's something I need to think more about. And uh, maybe I can talk to you afterwards about what the difference is, really. Um, uh, so Tom, does the unusual do all the work? Well, this is, it's too bad Sam Bray's not here because uh, he has shown, I think convincingly, that this phrase is an example of, of what's known as hendiatus, which I, I, I can't begin to define for you in any exact way, but it's basically the notion that you have two words conjoined uh, together in a phrase that have a complex single meaning, right? So you, I, can, I can tease them out for, for our purposes here. But in effect, I mean, the way I think about it is this. And if you look at the founding era actual usage, first of all, you see the word unusual frequently used during the revolutionary period. Well, I shouldn't say frequently, but used several times during the revolutionary period and again during the ratification period as a synonym for unconstitutional, right? They'll say, this is unusual, or this is an innovation, or this is unconstitutional. They're using it in the same sense, right? So, un and, and this is because the common law had a strong normative power to it, right? And this is, again, this is sort of explained in my paper, but it's worth taking a moment to talk about. The, um, the, the assumption underlying the common law, right? I mean, today we're all told that the common law is judge-made law, judges making policy from the bench. But in fact, it was considered to be a kind of customary law at the time of the founding, and really up until Holmes, 
Um, and if you ask the question, well, how can it be law even though it's never been ordered by the sovereign? How can law that doesn't come from the sovereign be law? The answer that common law ga uh, thinkers gave to that question was, well, if you have a practice that's used universally throughout the jurisdiction for a very long period of time, this is powerful evidence that it's reasonable and that it's just and that it enjoys the consent of the people, and therefore it can be enforced as law, right? Um, that idea over a long period of time grew into the very notion that actually the common law was normatively or morally superior to positive law because it was more reliably just and reasonable and more reliably in trying to extend the people. Because you don't know what positive law is going to do at the time you enact it, right? It's only after it's been around for a while that you know what it's actually going to do. And this was a large part of what gave rise to the notion of rights enforceable against the sovereign, right? That there's some things that even the sovereign can't do because they run contrary to long usage, right? And so the American Revolutionary period, the, the whole you know, sort of tenor of the, of the complaints about England was you can't take away the right to jury trial. That's guaranteed by long usage. You can't tax us without representation in Parliament. That's guaranteed by long usage. So there's this notion that, um, that long usage is the most reliable way as a practical matter to get to justice, to get to true reasonableness. That Abstract reasoning is not as reliable as long-standing prior practice. Now, we can contest whether that's true or not, but I think it's fairly clear that this is how common law thinkers thought about the problem. And that explains why you would have a prohibition of cruel and unusual punishments, because you'd say, well, no unjustly harsh punishments, right? That's the prohibition. We don't want unjustly harsh. Well, how do we tell it's unjustly harsh? We compare it to long-standing prior practice. That gives us, that gives us a con concrete reference point for measuring whether it's cruel or not. Um, and so, so bottom line is, I, it's not that unusual does all the work, but I would say that it does the concrete work. It does the work that allows us to apply the moral concept uh, in a practical way. That's, that's my basic argument. Our longstanding practice is to move to the second trinity, which is Will Board, Steve Sachs, and John McGuinness. Will. Uh, so I know you like <coughs> taking the clause one word at a time but I think this paper might show the importance of bringing some other words in before you move on from cruel. And actually, I'm thinking of the word punishment. So I think at the first four-fifths of the paper, you might do the textual argument against your position, sort of not enough justice, by talking about the word cruel in the abstract rather than cruel punishments. So you, I mean, you, know, you know there are these arguments that the, that the court has also made that punishment has an intent <coughs> aspect to it and that a, a, an intent aspect, that, that what, part of what makes something a, a bad treatment, a punishment, rather than just a tort or a, another accident, is that it's intended to teach you a lesson. And if there's something to that, then putting cruel with it might make you think that cruel is doing its intent work there. Similarly, like evil, you could talk about, you know, the evil day is going to come. But when we talk about an evil person, we might think that has like an intent aspect to it. In the same way, a cruel, cruel weather might not be intentional, but cruel punishments might be intentional. So I, I think you have some answers to this a little bit buried in the very back part of the paper, but I think you might sort of bring a lot more people on board by, by making the textual case harder for yourself uh, at the beginning. Steve. Oh, I was just wondering, and, and you may answer this in the paper, so I apologize if so. Suppose that we adopt a punishment and we use it for 50 years, and then we find out that, in fact, it inflicts way more pain than we realized. Like the one drug cocktail, it turns out actually is intensely painful, but people, you know, stay still so we don't know that or something. What happens? Because it seems like at that point it's no longer unusual. It's not like the new punishment that involves a higher risk of botched executions because we've been doing it for 50 years. It's just that we now find out that what we've been doing for 50 years is horribly painful. Uh, I was really a great uh, paper. I particularly liked how it made the meaning uh, so not only relevant but urgent to so many questions. That was a great way of framing it. My uh, one concern is is more methodological. Uh, it's not entirely clear what evidence uh, is going to what issue because, of course, a lot of originalists now, quite correctly in my view, separate out necessarily the meaning of the Bill of Rights from how it was um, uh, uh, put into the 14th Amendment, how it was incorporated into the 14th Amendment. It's very unclear what evidence goes to what from your description. Indeed, some of the evidence not quite clear to me what it should go to. Like you talk about a lot of treatises in the 1840s. 
not very clear at all. They give uh, evidence of the original meaning of uh, uh, the Bill of Rights. It might well be relevant to the uh, original meaning as it was understood. And I think your argument ultimately is there's a continuity in our original meaning. It doesn't mean different, which is fine. But that also needs to be shown, and it'd be much easier to show, I think, if you made that framework. And then also, I think you have some questions about showing why and how far you should go with post-judicial uh, evidence of what judges interpret it, even the, the, um, uh, the clause in, in the uh, 1880s. After all, they're generally, as I understand it, not interpreting the... Um, uh, uh, the Eighth Amendment as incorporated, but the Eighth Amendment, uh, the federal Eighth Amendment, is not so clear that they're rele how relevant they are to the original meaning. Under so those are methodological questions, I think, within originalism about the relevant evidence and about separating out uh, the question, which is, a, which is at least conceptually a separ severable question, I think, of the meaning of the Bill of Rights and the meaning as incorporated, even if in this case it's the same, you believe it's the same meaning. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so that's all three. So, um, excellent. So, great, again, great questions. So, Will, punishment and intent, and maybe, again, I can talk to you about the specifics of how to do this later. I, so, it's clear, punishment has to be intentional or it's not punishment, right? That's, that's very clear. The, and this is why I was originally using this culpable mental state idea. The fact that you intend to punish doesn't mean that you cruelly intend to punish, right? Or that you that your, your intent is to inflict a cruel punishment. So there, there's two different notions, right? And so what I'm trying to get at is, well, if the effect is caused by the punishment, right? So I am raped because you put me in an overcrowded prison. I am tortured to death because you gave me this three-drug protocol. You didn't intend it, but you, nonetheless, you caused it by your intentional act of punishing. Under what circumstances can that effect be considered part of the punishment and what, and what not? So like in a criminal law, Area this would correspond roughly to proximate cause type type questions. Which which effects of a but for cause can be attributed to the act or not? Um, and and again, I to me the best evidence is that it has to do with foreseeability that you're increasing the risk uh, uh, significantly over a longstanding baseline of common law um, prior practice. Um, but I don't know if that sufficiently answers your question. That's how I think about the issue. But maybe later we can talk about how to specifically fix that or make it m more clear up front. Um, okay, Steve, what happens when we discover 50 years later that the punishment is cruel? This is a super important problem in real life, right? So, like, what? So, so the first thing you'd have to imagine, the first counterfactual world is that the court suddenly wakes up one morning and decides to read Steneford on original meaning, which, of course, as we all know, it ain't going to happen. But if they did, uh, what do they do about? how to apply this standard in reality. And th this has to do with some issues like the one you raised, and which, which actually came up in the 19th century, when, you know, when, the, when the, um, sort of the Quakers started using imprisonment as a primary mode of punishment, and solitary confinement in particular as a mode of punishment, with the notion that you put someone in a room with a Bible and they will repent. That's why it's a penitentiary. You know, by the mid to late 19th century, we realized you put someone in a alone, alone in a room with or without a Bible, and they're going to go nuts, right? Like, it's, it's, it's a horribly cruel form of punishment. Um, and, you know, what happened, I, minor, and again, I haven't gone through this history in great detail, is that things like the use of solitary confinement fell, or at least long-term solitary confinement, fell out of usage or fell largely out of usage once people realized what was happening and then it made a big comeback in the 80s, right? And that's where Pelican Bay and Supermax and all that, all that kind of stuff. So I think, um, so I, I, and I think that you know one of the ideas behind the common law is that you can rely on on the people's sense of justice over a multi generational period. That is, at any one moment in time, we may be caught up in a panic where we want. You know, today it's sex offenders. There's nothing you can do to sex offenders that's too bad. In the 80s, it was drug offenders. In the 90s, it was juvenile super, super predators, whatever. But that if you look over a period of multiple generations, we're much more likely to get it right. And that's why longstanding prior practice is so important, because we look at, at multiple generations uh, for our baseline. Um, and so you can rely on, once we discover, at some point, once we discover that we're driving people insane, at some point, the people, assuming they're sufficiently aware of what's happening, can be relied upon to fix the problem. Uh, but of course, the problem we have today, and this is part of what I'm trying to address in this paper, is that so much punishment is non-transparent to the public today. 
Um, people just don't know what's going on in any real sense, right? Executions are behind closed doors. Prison is behind closed doors. So it's harder to rely on the public sense of justice to correct longstanding problems, right? Now, the court could do so. The court, once it understands this is the standard we need to apply, I think it would have to give itself some leeway and say, look, for at least since the 50s, we've been uh, using the wrong standard for determining whether a punishment is cruel and unusual or not. And so the mere fact that, that the various practices have grown up since the 50s that would be unduly harsh in light of longstanding prior practice, the mere fact that they now have 50 years of usage behind them or 30 years or whatever isn't going to save them. We're, we can treat them as new punishments because we just haven't been using the right standard and because the public is not sufficiently aware of what's going on to exercise its own judgment. And again, that's, that's the best I can do with that problem, it's, it's a, but it's a very serious problem. Um, and then finally, John, um, thanks so much. Again, this is a very serious problem, um, and it's one I, I've dealt with a little bit more in some other papers, and, and I, this is part of my compression problem on this one, which is that I didn't want to repeat myself. So part of it's that. Part of it, though, is, is as I said to Kurt today at lunch, um, everyone's discussion about the 14th Amendment just convinced me to steer clear of the 14th Amendment. Like, it's, it's, hard, it's very hard to figure out what... Uh, ex at least from my perspective, what exactly the 14th Amendment was intended to do. And so I've been operating, I've been operating with the sort of the jot for jot baseline as, as being okay. And, and, and part of my reason for that in this context, and I think there is good evidence of this throughout the 19th century, is that the, the fundamental notion about what the common law is and why it's an important limit on government really didn't change until Holmes, right? It really, so, so this notion of longstanding prior practice as a powerful constraint on government is evident in federal and state, state um, opinions throughout the 19th century. And so I think it's very likely that, um, that state limitations on, um, on punishment once, once the Eighth Amendment gets incorporated into the 14th Amendment would look very similar to federal limitations. But I need to make that more explicit in, in the paper, I think. And if I'm wrong in my assumptions, please let me know afterwards, and I'll, I'll do what I can to fix that. Um, right. uh, Don, did you want to? Um, well, just, just I mean, it's, it's, it's an ingenious solution because it does explain why the founders were putting in punishments um, uh, that we now would, would like to think are unconstitutional. But it's a very odd thing to do that I will vote for a bill to provide a punishment that I hope goes away and is then prevented by this other vote I'm about to cast from ever coming back. Um, uh, that's just a very odd attitude to have. I mean, that's not my argument. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where that idea comes from. Um, well, so, so, so cruel and long usage, right? Right. So, so the same punishments, which we would think of as prima facie unconstitutional today, they were certainly pr approving in 1791. Well, right. And so, and so, and this gets. And I wrote a different paper on this. This has to do with the notion of destitute, right? So, so again, if you think about what the common law was, part of the common law idea. Uh, remember that this notion that if a practice enjoys long usage is presumptively reasonable and just. Part of that idea was that if a once traditional punishment falls out of usage for a significant period of time, it's no longer part of our tradition. So that if someone tries to bring it back at a later date, it's now a new punishment once again. Um, and so you compare it to the tradition as it survived up to um, today. Um, and that explains, for example, why in Wilkerson versus Utah, the Supreme Court says uh, firing squad's OK because there's a continuous long-standing practice of using the fire, firing squad as a method of execution. On the other hand, the methods of punishment described by Blackstone, uh, sort of death by torture, are clearly not OK. Why? Because they're not part of our usage, and they haven't been part of our usage for a century. So, And there's a couple of other examples of this where courts, both the US Supreme Court and state courts, have said that if a once traditional practice falls out of usage for a long enough period of time, and again, the, the period seems to be normally about a century, but desuetude depends on a lot of various factors, like a lot of common law stuff does, so that's not a hard and fast rule. But it's out of usage for multiple generations. That means it hasn't stood the test of time, and, um, and so it's no longer considered a usual um, form of punishment. By the way, this explains why Justice Scalia, when he first got on the court and called himself a faint-hearted originalist, where he said, under my own theory, right, I would have to uphold branding and bodily mutilation, um, but even I would strike it down because I'm a faint-hearted, and then he later becomes less faint-hearted, right? But, um, 
But in fact, he was, his, his instinct was correct. Those forms of punishment had fallen out of usage so long ago that they are no longer part of our tradition. And under basic common law doctrine, they no longer enjoy the status of usual punishments. Next, Trinity. Uh, Randy Barnett, uh, Guy Burnett, and Laurie Klaus. Randy. Uh, I got in the queue so I could tell my Posner and the Oath story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but then I realized that it's being recorded. And uh, it's not the kind of story I can properly tell on camera, so I, I pass. <laughs> it's a rule. <laughs> not on camera. Uh, I just had a question, um, and this is this is one on, and I don't know what page this is. This is cruel intent, non non transparent punishment under that section, uh -huh. uh, and you, and you make a, a, a host of assumptions there that you don't cite, mm. and I was wondering where this comes from. Um, you said that uh, you know that the transparency argument that encouraged people to take pleasure in the pain of others, if if it was a public. Um, the culpable mental state of the punisher. So if they did it more transparent, oh, everyone would go out and enjoy it and it would hurt people more and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and I was kind of wondering, well, well, what about, isn't, what if we made this more transparent? Could things get more cruel? What, what if we opened this up and people watched it and said, oh, yeah, that's fantastic, right? I mean, this is the era of Tarantino movies. This is the era of Mad Max movies, right? I mean, there's just bloody murder everywhere, right? So that's my question is, could this ever be reversed if, we're, if the standard is what's been long-standing tradition, can it ever go backwards? Okay, uh, and, and, and by the way, let me, I should have apologized too. My, my footnoting noting is horrible. The way I write okay. is to try and get my writing right and then I go back with my footnoting, which is terrible. I just but, thought it might help. So, but the basic idea is this, right? And so I'm not saying the transparency guarantee. Oh, gosh darn it. I did it again. I'm so sorry. One more. One more. Sorry, <laughs> Follow up on uh, Tom's point about you know unusuals doing all the work, and you responded referencing Sam Bray's article on now my mind is the word hendiades is that how you pronounce it? I'm not uh, sure how to pronounce it. Yeah. Anyway, anyone else have a view? No. But hendiasis. Hendiasis. You think that? Okay. Okay. So, so all right, we'll go with that. And it sounds as though it needs to be diagnosed. <laughs> <laughs> so the question would be, well, when we go back to the English Bill of Rights, from which we're getting this phrase. It's in the list of James's, of the rights to be protected in the future that correspond to a list of James's wrongs. And in the list of wrongs, it's cruel and illegal, or illegal and cruel, right? Well, now, illegal's a freestanding concept. We wouldn't say that's just part of this, you know, one of these invented phrases that have to run together. Uh, so I think we've still got the question as to why cruel gets tacked on. Uh, and the first Congress doesn't help us. You know, Livermore says, well, of course we're going to be cruel to criminals, so what's our point of, of this thing? And, and the, they pass it as constitutional boilerplate, really. So I want to consider the possibility that all that cruel does is make clear that we're not addressing circumstances in which we choose to go soft on individuals, right? That it's only about the direction of greater severity in our discriminatory <laughs> behaviour. If we're discriminating because we're playing favourites with someone, that that's okay, and that seems to be compatible with the other phrases in the in the total provision, right? So excessiveness in bail, excessiveness in fines. We're not worried about a light fine. We're not worried about light bail. Why don't they just use excessiveness for punishments too? Well, you've got an objective referent for bail and fines, right? Uh, bail and fines are excessive if they're more than the defendant can pay, right? Because then they're operating as an indefinite prison sentence which is exactly what James's judges had been doing. So it seems, I think there's pretty good historical evidence that that's what they're targeting. In the context of other punishments, they're onto the thought that it's intrinsically subjective to just call them excessive, and rather than doing so, they use this reference to the law, the existing long usage. So maybe that's all Cruel is doing. Okay, is that everyone for this for this question? It was a, a doyaka or duaka. Um, okay, so... Uh, Transparency, again, uh, all I'm trying to say there is you, know, you will hear, um, it, it's just important to understand the way transparency works in criminal punishment. That, that is to say, you know, people will often say, why don't we execute in the public square? Well, because we don't want to coarsen public sensibilities, right? Why, you know, why don't we, why do we, why do we get rid of shaming punishments and we throw everyone in jail? Because, again, we don't want the public to enjoy the punishment is a degrading spectacle. And, and this sort of critique has been around since the 19th century. There are people saying it's degrading to watch the crowd enjoy this, right? Uh, but it's also true that there's good evidence that when the government makes, has made in the past the move to make punishment less transparent, 
it's done so to avoid political responses to cruelty, right? So when there's a botched execution, right, there are examples where the crowd tries to lynch the executioner because they're so outraged, right? Or in a more organized fashion, they try to abolish the death penalty because they're so outraged at the spectacle of cruelty. How do you get rid of that political action? You put it behind closed doors, right? So if you learn about the botched execution at all, you learn about it in the paper, and you're less outraged. And then, you know, and again, there's very good evidence that you know, the reason we have a three-drug protocol today is simply to do the same thing, to simply hide the cruel effect, not to eliminate it. If you wanted to eliminate it, you would just use barbiturates, but to hide it from public view, even when it's done behind um, closed doors. And there, there's an argument that people will make, which is that, well, we don't want to be cruel. We don't want people to look at this and enjoy it and make it like reality TV, and isn't that horrible? We don't want to be that people. And that's fine. I don't really want the public to enjoy it either. But if the price of that is, is that the public never gets mo mobilized politically to deal with cruelty, then I think that's a terrible price to pay. Now, I'm not saying they always will. I can't say that, that, that maybe they will enjoy it and nothing will happen. But historically, in the past, when there have been big, big movements to reform criminal punishment and make it less harsh, it's often been in response to some public cruelty that was just too much for the public to take. And now that's not there anymore. It makes political action much more difficult um, in this area. Um, again, uh, Lori, with regard to, to unusual and hendiatus and all that and cruel and illegal, one, th one point I want to make about cruel and illegal, I guess, and this is really important because this is something Scalia just fundamentally misunderstands because he's as much under the spell of Holmes as anyone on the left, right? Um, illegal does not, in this context, mean contrary to positive law. It's a synonym for unusual, right? So the notion is it's contrary to our longstanding prior practices. It's, it's not that the legislature didn't happen to authorize it, but that it is fundamentally wrongful, right? That, that's the notion. Um, and I think that does include a discriminatory component. I think we've talked about this. I, I agree that one of the circumstances in which you can expect cruel punishment to arise is when the sovereign is singling out a person or a group for special disfavor because they dislike him. I mean, Titus Oates, for example, everyone hated Oates. Jeffries hated Oates. He was looking for something new he could do to Oates that was worse than the common law would permit. But I don't think that either the language or the historical practice uh, supports the notion that that is all that the clause was meant to prohibit. I think it's anything that's harsher than the common law would permit. But again, that would take a lot more time to work out uh, that disagreement. Uh, Oates, of course, famously survived, despite Jeffrey's hope that he wouldn't do. He was like a cockroach in a nuclear war. Yeah, he survived. Uh, next group, Richard Ray, uh, Brian Wildenthal, and Mike Ramsey. Richard. Oh, I have shared Will's reaction that the, the piece uh, maybe would be more effective if framed as being about cruel punishments. And in light of your exchange with Will, I, I would just want to underscore what I think maybe are three different flavors of that concern that, that I think Will alluded to and, and maybe you, you in part alluded to. One is that uh, the word punishment itself encodes a kind of mens rea component. You definitely address that in response to Will. The second is that the word cruel is a chameleon word that we can construe in light of context, so it's ambiguous. I think that version also you kind of address in response to Will and is obviously part of what the paper is doing about trying to find out how ambiguous this word can be. But I think there's a third version that's slightly different, which is that when we use adjectives with nouns like this, uh, as we do with adjectives, uh, sometimes what we mean is that we're using the adjective with respect to the nature of the thing we're describing. So for example, if I say this is a beautiful book, what I mean is it's beautiful in the way that uh, it, the book is beautiful qua book. The things that are good about books are the things that I'm talking about here. I'm not saying that beautiful is a synonym for well-written. I'm not saying that being well-written is encoded in the meaning of book. And I think it's that third kind of possibility that this is cruel, uh, this, is a, this punishment is cruel in its nature as a punishment that might be the um, the a third possible way to extract the kind of mens rea requirement here. Well, I love papers like this. We have, we have a lot of great, you know, theoretical and methodological papers, but the ones that zero in on these very fine-grained, concrete issues, I think, are surprisingly revealing. So I, I want to echo. There were a couple of previous comments about the scope of the paper and focusing on one word at a time, and so I and I. Uh, Chris beat me to the punch on inflicted, which I'm going to quickly come back to, and then and I think Will made a point about punishment and what that tells us. So it, it does seem to me that, um, it, and, you, and you had a good arguments about cruel and unusual, uh, 
um, and there is something to say about punishment. I think the word inflicted, the way I would read that on the intentionality to kind of effects or results spectrum, it seems to me that inflicted leans heavily toward effects and results. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but it's one thing that always bothered me about this, the, the, the Justice Scalia's and Thomas's view that all you look at is the sentence that was imposed and then what actually happens to the prisoner somehow doesn't matter as much. That doesn't square with the idea of in, inflicted, which seems to intuitively suggest what happens between the guard or the executioner or the person there. So, and, and a bit more broadly, I think one reason it in terms of the scope of the paper, there is no cruel clause, there is no punishment clause. It is a cruel and unusual punishments inflicted clause. I mean, so all the words are there, and so you almost have to to, to um, accurately understand it. I think you have to look at all those elements, even though I take the point that it's you are got a lot to work through and taking it one thing um, at a time. So that is kind of my general comment that, it, you know, that is inflicted maybe have a lot more to tell us in, in a ways that I think would support what I take to be your um, approach. <clears throat> Mike. Um, yeah, I, I like these kind of papers too because they're, I can sort of understand them. On the other <laughs> I was too embarrassed uh, to say that. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and and yeah and, and it, so I, and I, I like the the methodology is uh, I, th I think very sound in the in the sense of going back and, and looking at the English origins of course that's something that, that appeals to me a lot and and uh, also I uh, I and endorse the idea of not thinking about the Fourteenth Amendment as well that's getting too hard for me to do but um, but I do have some thoughts about um, sort of going back through the the um, the evidence uh, so uh, just a couple. Um, it, it seemed like that actually maybe there's you're asking two questions about cruel, and the first one is on the intent, whether you need the intent to inflict. Um, and in that regard, I want to say something in, in uh, mild defense of, of Thomas and Scalia, um, at least in this sense, um, that it doesn't seem to me, uh, in looking at your evidence, that you really have uh, much on this point because. The instances that you look at are all situations in which the effect of the punishment is what would have been naturally intended by the person imposing the punishment. Um, and so in that sense, it seems just to follow that intent in the, in the Scalia-Thomas sense um, is present. Scalia and Thomas are talking about situations in which there, there, there's an unintended additional punishment. Uh, or an un un unintended additional infliction of pain. Um, and um, the, the 18th century uh, situations and discussions that you have just don't have that issue. And so, of course, when they're talking about what it takes to be cruel and unusual, they don't talk about that because they're not thinking about that. They're, they're assuming an intent. They're not, they're not confronted with a situation in which there, there is, an, uh, in, in a sense, an accidental or an unintentional inflection um, of, uh, uh, of pain. So it, it, it really seems to me, without defending Scalia and Thomas's conclusion, it seems to me that, that I, I'm not sure how much of a dent you really make in it. Um, because we just don't, they just didn't think about that. And then I don't know what you do with that. That's sort of a, that's a separate methodological question. Um, it, it then seems like there's also a separate question that you're, that you're wrestling with, although I, it seems sort of submerged in the discussion. But, but you say um, that what cruel means um, is that it is, quote, unjustly harsh. Uh, and, and my question on that point is, um, why is it that it is unjustly harsh? as opposed to just harsh. Because when I look at a lot of these, not, not all of the sources are like this, but a number of the sources, um, what they're talking about is these, just these outrageous tortures. Um, that, and, and that seems to me to be focusing on uh, you know, the, 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 the rack and the wheel and the flaying alive and that kind of stuff. They're, they're not talking about that in the sense of being sort of unjustly harsh. That, that stuff's just harsh. And I think maybe the reason we might think they're thinking unjustly is because then, you know, Don has a list of all the terrible things that they did, um, like cutting people's noses and branding and all that sort of stuff. But it may be that they just were in a, what we would view as a much harsher time. And, and they didn't think that kind of stuff was all that harsh. <laughs> 
you didn't cross the harsh threshold until you got into the stuff that they that they describe when they and, and I think this fits with um, with the old stuff too because that I think you could regard that basically whipping to death um, as as without taking account of whether it's unjust, just that's just harsh, right? And so I think when you're trying to establish a proposition whether it means harsh or unjustly harsh, then you have some that, like the Blackstone stuff, does sort of maybe cut your way. And But I would suggest that you you actually confront this issue directly and, and, and sort of, it's sort of submerged by implication um, and really take this issue on because I think it's a, it's an important question about what cruel means because you, you bring in this unjustly um, w w without directly building a case for it. All you, you indirectly have, but I just don't, I don't think the case is, is all that great. I think it's, it's sort of mixed. Um, and, and then I guess the, the, then the last thing I would say connecting up to that um, is, is actually sort of maybe a response to Tom um, on uh, cruel and an unusual. And, and I admit that, and there are people in this room who have thought a lot more about this than I have, but it, 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 could it not be the case that um, unusual is doing a lot, not all, a lot of the work, um, and that cruel is actually um, a modification of unusual in the sense that what we're worried about is unusual punishments, except we're only worried about them if they're cruel, that is, if they're harsh. Um, and, and so we, we, the, the, the result of that is um, that we can defend a punishment either on the ground that it's not cruel, not harsh, or on the ground that it's common. And so even if we regard the death penalty as cruel, um, as Blackstone apparently did, we, we, it would nonetheless not be unusual um, in any event. Uh, that's all I got. John. Oh, that's me. three. That's, I forgot. That's yep. my name. OK. Um, <laughs> so uh, OK. So uh, Richard, first of all, and again, I, I, I think we may need, need to talk more. So I'm not sure I followed everything you said about the three flavors of um, cruel. Um, the uh, and, and in particular, the third one, which you said I didn't address, where, where, where it's a, a description of the nature of the thing um, itself. So I may just have to defer that to later because I don't think I can I can answer it now because I'm not sure what you're unless you want to you can clarify for me. Uh, what, what you mean by that or what, well, what, how that cuts. If Sam were here, he'd have a Greek expression to capture this use of language. But, right. but, but I, think, I think the example I have, you know, a, a, when we say a beautiful book as opposed to a beautiful person or a beautiful day or, you know, the meaning of beautiful is not, you know, it comes across very differently in those contexts, not because of an ambiguity in the meaning of beauty, but because we're describing beauty with reference to a thing that has a certain teleological uh, nature. And so you have to, so in other words, you can't talk about cruel without talking about punishment. Because right. It's, I mean, I think that's right. I think that's absolutely right. And maybe I need to make that more, uh, more explicit uh, in, in this paper. I mean, I think that's, for example, when I did a search in the databases about general usages of the word cruel, I only, I only looked for cruel within five words of punishment because in that, it, it, it's going to have a very different valence in that context than in others. I don't think this is an objection so much as a way of crystallizing that you are, in fact, Okay. Capable addressing this. Right. Okay. That's great. Right. And again, because I do need to make that more concrete. Um, okay. The um, Brian. Um, thanks very much. Again, so I have two votes for inflicted now, which is, I, I, this is, this is going to help me because I'm going to spend. I am going to spend. I. I. I uh, many of you probably know Albert Al Schuler. He's read all my stuff, and he actually threatened to never read another Eighth Amendment article by me if I wrote it because I've written too many. But now, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell him that everyone says I have to. Um, Okay, the, uh, but I will look at that more closely. Um, the, uh, okay, so Mike, um, several questions here. First of all, regarding the intent, you say I don't have that much evidence on point, and I, that's, that's right. There's not a lot, and, and the reason for that is because sort of the standard case where a punishment is cruel is going to be a case where, uh, where the effects are intended, right? So we can say the legislature is authorizing a punishment that's much harsher than was ever permitted before, um, or a judge is doing something much harsher than has been done before. And that is, that's intentional, and that's kind of the standard case, right? And so the question is, what about cases where there are unintended effects of punishment, right? That's the only kind of situation where I could test my hypothesis. Um, and, and the problem is that there, as an absolute matter, in the late 18th and early 19th century, there's a very small number of cases that dealing at all with cruel punishments or cruel and unusual 
punishments. But it does happen that one of them uh, does deal with, uh, with the unintended consequences of punishment. And that's that joint fine case from 1799, Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, uh, where, and again, we don't have opinions from all the judges, but one of the judges in the majority was very explicit in saying, look, when the jury imposed a joint fine, that is cruel and unusual because it creates the risk that if one of the defendants defaults, the other defendants will pay a, dispropor a disproportionate uh, fine or they'll have to go to jail for a longer period of time if they can't pay the fine than they really deserve, right? So this is at least one example out of a handful of cases from this era involving this issue at all, where the court um, does, at least, at least one of the small number of judges who gave an opinion on this case explicitly says that the unintended effects of punishment um, can be cruel and unusual. And he explicitly ties it to a pre-existing common law norm. He says there's a common law rule against joint fines specifically because of this risk. And so when you violate that common law rule and create that risk, you're imposing a cruel and unusual punishment. We actually see the other main example I would, I would give is actually um, from, uh, uh, from the 20th century. The, 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 one of the cases that Justices Scalia and Thomas rely on for the cruel intent standard uh, is the, the Francis X. Rell West, West Weber case, the, the execution case, where there's a botched attempt to electrocute someone um, he survives, and then they want to re-execute him six days later, and the court allows them to go ahead and do it, and the court's very split as to, uh, as to why um, it's okay, or whether it's okay and why it's okay for the government to go ahead um, and do this. But the plurality opinion, even the plurality opinion that allows it to happen, um, and, that, um, and that is relied on uh, by, by Scalia and Thomas as evidence of cruel intent, actually says, well, the, the first botched execution was unforeseeable, and we're not going to hold the government uh, responsible for an unforeseeable um, punishment, right? And, and, and of course, uh, sitting in the middle is Justice Frankfurter, who's sort of like, I don't know if it's intent or it's a fact or what, so I'm not going to decide, but this, but this is okay. We can execute this guy, right? So, so there you have a very clear case of an accident where the court seems to be saying, because it's an unforeseeable accident, it's okay. The intention is that electrocution be more reliable and less risky than hanging. Uh, in this case, we had an unforeseeable accident, and therefore, it's not part of the punishment, which, again, is, is consistent with my reading of the clause. I admit it's not a lot of material, um, but it is at least some, and it's more material than there is for the other case, for the, the cruel intent uh, requirement. Um, why unjustly harsh? Well, um, again, you know, this was this provision was drafted in an era of moral realism, right? And so, so punishments were um, were okay if they were um, considered just in some sense, if they were co consistent with the reason of the common law, as as uh, as lawyers would have said at the time. And there are two ways, uh, at least, that a punishment could be inconsistent with the reason of the common law. One is if it's disproportionate to the offense, right? But the other is if it's too harsh as an absolute matter to be consist consistent with justice, right? So things like death by torture, it's not that they were too harsh for a crime. It's just that they were too harsh for justice, right? And it's, they were not, this was not a morally neutral description. It was, it was um, unjustly harsh. And that's why the Constitution prohibits it, um, is because it's, it's unjustly harsh. Um, and, and one way I know that, uh, or at least I'm reasonably confident of that, is that if you look at state constitutions from this era, some of them prohibit cruel and unusual punishments, some prohibit cruel or unusual punishments, some prohibit cruel punishments. Um, but it appears they were all interpreted in the same way, which is that if the punishment is considered unjustly harsh in light of longstanding prior practice, it was unconstitutional. Um, and uh, the, um, so again, you said I need to confront this more directly, and I, I will do so in my next draft. So thank you. Again, that was part of that shorthand. Um, finally, is unusual doing a lot of the work? Uh, does cruel modify the meaning of unusual, you say? And then you say, then you use uncommon as your synonym for unusual, which my whole argument is that unusual does not mean uncommon. It means new. It means contrary to long usage, right? Um, and again, it's not that cruel modifies the meaning, because unusual, if something is new and contrary to longstanding common law rights, uh, 
then it's unjust. And if, it's, if, it, if, the, if the manner in which it's unjust is that it's harsher than longstanding prior practice permits, then it's cruel and unusual. But again, I think the best way to think of it is as a sort of single complex meaning, as, as Sam has argued in his recent article. We have one minute left, and I have one question left from um, Larry Solon. Can we do it in one minute? Yes, we can. Uh, I think we could talk about this more later. You uh, should reject Sam Gray's reading, uh, and it is not, and Hendiatus is not that there's a single complex meaning. Uh, it is that uh, one of the two words in the phrase modifies the other. So uh, war, the room was uh, nice and warm. It's not that the room was nice and the room was warm. It's that the warmness of the room was nice. This is not your interpretation of the cruel and unusual punishment clause. It's not that the cruelness was contrary to long usage, right, as opposed to the punishment. If, if you accept Sam's, uh, uh, if you accept Sam's theory, then your whole picture falls apart. So you have to argue that this is not an example of uh, Hendiatus, which it is not, which it is not. If you read Sam very carefully, I think you will see that, in fact, he has not established that it's Hendiatus, that his analysis leads you to the opposite conclusion, that it's not an example of Hendiatus. So I, you really want to reject Bray. Okay. Let's talk more about this. As, the, as we conclude, uh, thanks for this session uh, to John and to Don Drips. And uh, as we conclude the program, uh, thanks uh, to the organizers, to Mike Rappaport and to Michael Ramsey and to everyone uh, for participating in once again a superb event. So thanks to all.